The White House is gearing up to launch an all-out offense for Democrats with less than two weeks to go until the midterm election. President Biden and his cabinet will be out on the campaign trail starting tomorrow. Their closing argument will be a big one. Economy, economy, economy. The president will argue he is focused on building an economy from the bottom up and the middle out. And in a recent interview, the president said he believes American voters are also concerned about the future of democracy. If you notice the generic polling about the American public, they're 40, 50, 60 percent are worried about the survival of democracy. The whole idea is the other team doesn't want people to vote. I they know. don't want right. open voting. Yeah. They don't want to be able to right. mail in ballot. So far, nearly 13 million Americans have already voted in person or by mail. Meanwhile, new reporting points to a rise in efforts to harass and intimidate voters and election workers. The Washington Post says Trump supporters who believe the 2020 election was stolen, which it wasn't, are recruiting poll watchers for battleground states. And Axios reports national extremist groups are working to disrupt the midterms in local communities by signing up as Dropbox watchers. One former Justice Department official says that she has been warning local officials to look out for groups like the Proud Boys. There's been a lot more sort of strategy and organizing uh, between 2020 and these midterms. But a very, very concerted effort at a decentralized voter intimidation scheme, as well as election worker intimidation scheme. Just really anything to muck things up. DOJ says it is preparing to respond to any disruptions on Election Day and possible attempts to stop people from voting. We're also following the latest on the investigations swirling around the former president, of course. His lawyers have formally accepted the January 6th committee subpoena demanding documents and testimony by next month. And a judge has now ordered Mark Meadows, Trump's final White House chief of staff, to testify to a Georgia grand jury. The panel has been investigating possible election interference in Georgia by the ex-president hammering their opponents with in the final days before the midterms. But they are something those Republicans are not telling voters. The crime, the crime they're scaring voters with, a lot of it is happening in their own red backyards. Jim Kessler's organization, Third Way, published a study titled The Red State Murder Problem. He's also a former legislative and policy director for Chuck Schumer. Jim, your study's title says a lot. So let's begin with the facts about murder rates. Walk us through it. Well, the murder rate in Trump voting states is 40 percent higher than the murder rate in Biden voting states. Eight of the 10 states with the highest murder rates in the country not only voted for Trump in 2020, they voted Republican in every single presidential election this century. And we looked at the size of police departments in the 25 largest Democratic-run cities and the 25 largest Republican-run cities on a per capita basis police departments in Democratic-run cities are 75 percent larger. Broaden this out. Overall crimes in red states compared to blue states. I pause because just hearing you say that, it just makes me wonder, why aren't others saying this all day, every day? Right. And we put this report out in March, and the hope was really to, to change this narrative. And, you know, look, you had James Cargill talking about this you know, three minutes ago on this segment. And he's right. If Democrats don't own the crime issue and don't define it, it'll be owned for them. And, you know, I, I just think Democrats have been derelict telling the story and Republicans have been telling a far more. It's not a true story, but it's a convincing story. And, um, you know, we're paying the price for it. But isn't that crazy? You know, Paul Krugman, uh, Krugman has a column out right now, and it refers to red delusions about purple reality. And he basically is saying that these right wingers, they talk about all these bad things, but they offer no solutions. How is it that voters don't see this? Yeah, I think I think particularly on crime, there's a laziness in, in the media, frankly, about crime. There's 60 murders that happen typically every single day. And the question is, what murder is going to be covered? And it's usually going to be a murder in a city near a media market like New York or Los Angeles or Oakland, someplace like that. The fact of the matter is the murder capital of California for five years running is Kern County. The biggest city there is Bakersfield. That is a Republican-run city, a Republican-run county. And the they get to call their congressman Kevin McCarthy. So, you know, I, I just think this is an issue that's very easy to demagogue. 
And again, I would say Democrats have stepped on it themselves. Defund the police was really dangerous words to put out there. Mainstream Democrats didn't come out and squash it right away. And Republicans were allowed to control the narrative. So right now, there's two weeks to go. What do Democrats do? I mean, the fact that you just laid out there that the highest murder rate is in Bakersfield and the person to point to is Kevin McCarthy, the same person who goes on Fox News every day railing against Biden and crime. It's McCarthy's issue. Can can Democrats have time to make that issue? And why haven't they yet? You can pick up the phone and call Chuck Schumer and say, yo, Chuck, why aren't you handling this? Well, I don't I don't know if there's time left. I mean, this is if, if I could do I take a time machine and go back six months, I, you know, I would try and convince them even harder than I did back then that you've got to control this issue. Two weeks is a short time, but we need to be doing something on this. Republicans are hammering us on this uh, message. And then we have to look past November and make sure we get control of it in 2024, because this will be an issue that will bedevil us in a presidential year as well. The truth matters, but only if you hear it. And so people deserve to hear it, because if you don't, lies are going to fill that empty. The last thing before we go tonight, basketball is easy. Life is hard. That quote from former NBA player Kenny Anderson is from a documentary about his life and the hardships he faced growing up in Queens, New York. Anderson is now the head coach of Fisk University basketball team in Nashville, Tennessee. And one of his new players can definitely relate to some of the struggles he's endured. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park has this amazing story. Jeremiah Armstead picked up a basketball at 14. The same age he realized life wasn't a game. I feel like I was a man at 14. That's what I feel like. Because that's when like they really picked up homelessness and stuff like that. For years, Jeremiah says he moved from shelter to shelter with his mom and two siblings. We was living off food stamps. What would you say were some of the the darkest times in your life? Sleeping at beaches, people walking by, looking in the car. But stuff like that builds character. So I can't be mad at stuff like that. Homelessness pushed Jeremiah to fight harder for his goals. Can't is not in my vocabulary. He excelled as a student in California and as an athlete. A winning combination that got him into Fisk University in Nashville and a spot on the basketball team. Nice. The grit definitely sets him apart. Former NBA point guard Kenny Anderson now coaches a rising star and sees a lot of himself in Jeremiah. My best year of my high school career, I, was, I didn't have nowhere to live. We got evicted. The NBA legend beat the odds and believes Jeremiah can too. Meanwhile, his cheering squad couldn't be prouder. This is a child who deserves to just show what he can do. What's the end game for you? My first goal, which is get my mom, brother, and sister out the shelter that they in. Family first, while making moves on and off the court. Kathy Park, NBC News, Nashville. Back in September, Jeremiah told the Washington Post that he's thankful that people were willing to take a chance on him. He goes on to say, even though I went through a tough time, it made me the person I am today, and I'm excited to see how it all turns out. Well, we are too, Jeremiah. And, you know, every night we talk about a lot of really terrible people doing really terrible things. You know what we are also talking about? Good people doing great things.